Can you all see the screen? Yes, no. Yes. Sir. Okay, so um, let's quickly go with, as we always do, a quick summary. So who will give a quick summary? Anna, how about you? Are you there? Good evening. Sorry, could not catch you. Can you speak again? I still can't catch you. Okay, you're trying to search your bio book. Okay, fine. Please. But um, let's start with you for a quick summary. Of the last class. Okay. Where did we start in the last class? I think biological evolution, right? Yeah. Okay. Very well. Uh, biological evolution. Uh... Mm. They like evolved by natural selection. Okay, right. So biological evolution talks about beginning, right from the very beginning of life, starting with cellular. Once the cell is formed, so we are ahead. Uh, we are talking about uh, what happens after life has originated. One single cell life is now into existence. And from there onwards, can cellular forms, can unicellular life also uh, undergo biological evolution? Of course, they, they are undergoing a biological evolution and that also through natural selection. But yes, yeah, tell me, continue. Um, yeah, so said, is it possible for organisms to evolve faster? Then few of, few of us said no, and few of us said yes, I said yes. Said like, we do some outside uh, resources as they say. And then you said that isn't the right um, uh, answer. And then you gave more grounds in the field. Can I explain it properly? Mm -hmm. uh um, I think we discussed about evolution. B branching descent is the next topic, but what would we discuss about? I asked you to, di I dictated you to write certain things and there were certain things that you must be knowing. If this question comes, is it possible for some organisms to evolve faster than others? What do we know about it? The variation, yes, the variation of uh, sexual reproduction and mutation. In one, in a single cellular organisms, there cannot be sexual reproduction per se. Or mutation. There can be mutation, but that does not answer the question. Why can they evolve faster than others? Mutations can be in both. Unis variation also happens in both, both the prokaryotic, eukaryotic, unicellular, multicellular organisms. Variation can come through mutation or variation can come through sexual reproduction. So you didn't go back and revise, right? The last class. So uh, don't do that, please. We had uh, extra classes and started with Yeah, that thing will happen. Uh, if you are if you are planning to study biology in your free time, then that will never come, my friend. You cannot study biology when you have nothing else to do in life. You know, you have to study biology being in the puddle. You have to wake up, you have to brush your teeth, you have to get ready for your work, you have to give other exams, you have to study other subjects, you have to play, you have to make friends, talk to them, eat, sleep, and also study biology in between, right? You all have 24 hours. So it's all about time management. So please go back, everyone. See, howsoever, how so big effort I make in the class. There are two ways to conduct classes. 
one requires more effort than the other and many teachers choose that way to put in more efforts because they believe that students will benefit from it but the benefit can only come if you go back right after the class within the next 24 hours sit and revise ponder upon what you learned in the last class if you're going to just write down close your notebooks till the next class comes there's no point because at the end of the year you will not even remember in this topic what efforts did i make so there is no point of me making efforts i can just continuously keep dictating like i can just basically you know regurgitate for you ncrt make um, give you notes and the syllabus will be covered but you are failing the whole process if you are not going back and not revising not bringing your ideas and opinions and inputs about the understanding of the topics in the syllabus so this is a very valid question it's a very interesting question if you are reading biology right is it possible for some organisms to evolve faster than others and you don't know uh, even after we discussed that in the class you did, you have wrote the answers so that means there's some something that you also have to do from your side not apart from just paying the fees to just see me or hear me talking okay you're not paying the money to hear me talking i'm not that good uh, orator or a spiritual leader okay i'm a teacher apart from paying the fees you have to make efforts as well otherwise this this relationship will not yield good fruits even after the end of the syllabus okay everyone so let's go to z z how about you giving a summary so actually starting from branching okay let's start from biological evolution what if this what, what do you want what is your answer is it possible for some organisms to evolve faster than others yes or no and why Uh, yes, so it's possible uh, for for some organisms to develop or evolve faster uh, than mm -hmm. other organisms. So. Develop is not a good word. Development, I told you, we don't use development as a word when we are studying evolution because developmental biology means when you are studying the development of an organism right from the zygote to the full body, okay? So development can be faster and slower for sure. I'm talking about evolution. Uh, yes, can uh, yes. Like uh, we took examples of uh, a bacteria and an elephant. Uh, they both mm -hmm. reproduce, but uh, bacteria reproduces more frequently and uh, have more progenies as compared to it's elephant. It's not more frequently. Bacteria reproduces faster. Frequently means something that happens very often. But um, the opposite of frequently is like rarely. But we are talking about slow and fast here. So bacteria do reproduce but they reproduce through uh, cellular division right yes fission remember binary fission and they do it very fast every 20 minutes a bacteria can divide and give rise to two daughter cells yes continue Is that good uh, so as the progenies uh, develop more and more uh, as they reproduce more and more they evolve uh, faster uh, why as what they, is they, what is what is the relation is, between what is the relation between develop um, reproducing faster and evolving faster uh, i think there will be genetic changes uh, uh, you are in, right right correct you are correct parents. and where will the where will those genetic changes come from uh, in a bacteria from climatic changes uh, other uh, like climatic changes are not happening inside a bacteria yes from um, rna i think uh, sorry there was the mutations word, uh, simple mutations. there is one word mutations mutation bring changes in organisms that do not reproduce sexually yes correct okay Yes, so more so mutations can be can be passed on to the next generation very very fast 
in unicellular organisms and that's why they evolve faster than other organisms right because the variations can be passed on very fast so within one month you can have a million bacteria but in two years you will only have one more elephant from two elephants right yes sir. okay very well continue then what was branching descent uh, branching descent is a uh, uh, we can see it is a branching uh, a type of map that shows uh, uh, the uh, from where did the life started and uh, how they uh, how the organisms evolved uh, and uh, through what stages uh, did they went uh, from which uh, organisms to which organisms they evolved uh, so, so so branching descent mostly talks about the common ancestors which organism shared a common link right simple yeah. just one line answer and branching descent and natural selection are the key concepts of darwinian theory that we just studied right yes. and then we started with lamarckism okay let me let me go to atif atif you are there oh, would you like to take from lamarckism yes sir one minute yeah okay so so we learned about uh, lamarckism which is also known as the doctrine of descent so this theory was proposed by uh, lamarck which says that the evolution of life forms had occurred and driven by use and disuse of organs like basically if an organ like improves one a part of its body or an organ like it can pass on to its offspring so lamarckism gave a example of the long neck of giraffes so giraffes attempted to forage leaves from taller trees and uh, they had to stretch their uh, necks to reach the uh, top leaves on these trees and due to that their their necks slightly stretched and soon it adapted to a longer neck and lamarck lamarck claimed that they passed on this acquired character of elongated necks to the succeeding generations this yes. theory is now disproved yes and and why is this theory disproven like what what do you think are the reasons that we do not believe in this theory what is the problem with this theory yeah this theory focuses on like uh, acquired characteristics which cannot be passed on and to succeeding generations as it is more, uh, reper the uh, reproduction of offspring is mostly based on gen genetics for example if you take if you cut off the tail of two mouses and then make them breed then the offspring will have a tail since it is there in the genes so we yes, can easily disprove the theory with this example yes right yes continue Yes, so we learned, then we learned about the mechanisms of evolution. We learned uh, about mutations, which are like sudden and random and directionless changes, which can be inherited. So mutations don't have direction, and they are very random. And depending on this, they might either be beneficial or detrimental for the organism. And large variations that happen due to single step mutations are, are also known as uh, saltations. Yes, and uh, what can mutations? bring mutations can actually make big changes right in one single step yes sir. which darwinian variation will take a very long time to do correct yes yeah. okay good and then we started with hardy winberg principle yes continue yes so the hardy winberg principle states that the allele frequency allele frequencies in a given population are stable and is mostly constant from generation to generation that is the gene pool which is the total genes and their alleles in a population remains constant so yeah the hardy weinberg principle is, the hardy weinberg principle is the uh, is the concept of genetic equilibrium and mathematically you can represent that the sum total of all allelic frequencies is one 
So if we take an example, we can take uh, two alleles, capital T and small t. Mm-hmm. So there are three possibilities: uh, capital T, capital T, small, small t, small t, and then capital T and small t. So yes. capital T cap. So the frequency, let the frequency of uh, capital T be p and the frequency of small t be q. So capital T, capital T will be p square. Uh, cap- small t, small t will be q square. But capital T, small t can have two possibilities. The so either one can come from the mother and either one can come from the father. So due to this, sir, it has two possibilities. Therefore, it has two PQ. So if we add all of this together, we can give it as one. And from the mathematical formula, a plus b the whole square, we can write it as p plus q the whole square gives one. Yes, right. And then we were discussed the last thing that we started in the last class was factors that can affect Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. Okay, so I'll take I'll take on from here. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay, so having studied that and having understood that, now let's talk to uh, let's go to understand what are the factors. Uh, yes, anyone has a question? Yes, please. Is it possible that you can show uh, after embryo um, uh, embryological records proposed by uh, Ernest Hecker? I'll just explain to you. Uh, sorry, uh, what do you want me to show? Come again. Uh, do you remember that you told us to show the PPT and all those things? After that, I didn't attend one class actually. So. Okay, you want me to go up and show you certain. This one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, can you go a little bit up? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, uh, honestly, yeah, that one. The second. This one? Yeah, yeah. So this is a paragraph from your NCRT only that I've okay. put in here to explain the thing. And did you go through the video? Do you have any doubts regarding this, Anna? I don't think you can do a video now. They have not sent you a video. Okay. You have been added to the group, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. you can just write you can just write on the group that you re- you need the video links for um, the particular lecture talking about embryological support of evolution and it will be provided to you there. Okay. I'll I'll try to put it there. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Shall I continue for this class? Can I just take the screenshot now? Sorry. Yes, sure. Yeah, I completed this one. Um, the next one, please. So this is about the comparative and anatomical and morphological evidence that talks about homologous Homologous. and analogous organs. And homologous organs basically drive evolution in a way which is known as a divergent evolution and analogous organs drive convergent evolutions basically they are the results of these two evolutionary uh, evolutionary processes okay okay so homologous and then went to see analogous organs analogous is there analogous this one yeah no one more yeah Okay, this is homologous organs. Yes, this is analogous organs. Sorry, sir, I'm taking it. It's okay. Basically, you can. Um, okay, the potato and sweet potato can work. Yes, so potato and sweet potato are basically their, their common function is to store food, right? So they are, they are also a plant plant based example of uh, analogy analogous organs. So analogous organs are different in their structure but common in their function. Homologous are opposite; they are uh, similar in their structure but different in their functions. Okay. And then the nose of humans and Jacobson organ of snake were the two uh, other organs that has this common function of smell, olfaction, but they are different structures. Um, so you cannot send this document to um, the group? 
it's a very big document to be converted in PDF. This is what it says whenever I try to convert it into PDF. Oh, yeah. Can you just make screenshots and send it to me? Yeah, I think um, I can ask the operations team if they can do this. There must be a way to get it done as handouts. Biological evolution, you want? Yeah. Is it possible, sir? Uh, which, which, what, what do you want? Come again? From analogous to biological evolution, sir. Okay, understood. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll see if it can be converted and sent to you. Okay, don't worry. Analogous organs to biological evolution, basically from convergent evolution to biological evolution. Okay, cool. Uh, uh, and the uh, homologous organs. Also. Okay, okay. Sorry, homologous organs. Let me just try these things. Okay. Just put a message on the group, okay, also for as a reminder, and I'll also ask it. Send it now? now. You can send it now, you can send it afterwards after the class, okay, no problem. Okay, so coming back, so we, we have to discuss what factors can affect Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. Now, we consider the gene pool to be in equilibrium. And in fact, very interestingly, you know, um, we're talking about the gene pool that uh, different genes are, um, you know, um, same, like the gene pool is constant in any given population. For example, if we take the example of humans, there can be a finite number of uh, ways or the finite number of um, shapes the human nose or the eye or the eyebrows can have. You know, it cannot be infinite variations. And there was a amazing, there was a beautiful paper that got published this week only on 23rd of August that was submitted and published. It was accepted and published where they have used artificial intelligence algorithms to just uh, figure out similar looking faces from a big bulk of data. And these people do not know each other. They have never met. They are, dis they are not even related to each other. They are very distant from each other um, if you talk about their ancestry, but they still they look similar. Now, the next question is, do they just look similar by chance or some permutation combination of effects of the gene or their genetic material or their genetic makeup is also similar. So it so this paper says that their genetic makeup, like their their DNA also is similar, even though they are not related to each other. Interesting, right? So you can go and find out this if you want to just look at the figures and try to, then you will see the faces that this algorithm, the AI has selected the, they look like, some of them look like uh, twins, identical twins actually, grown up twins, but they are not, they are distant, they don't even know each other. Okay, so gene flow or gene, okay, so first thing, first factor that can affect, I think we talked about the first factor already, right? Did we? Zed? Atif? Sorry, sir. Did we already have talked about the first factor that affects Hardy Weinberg equilibrium, gene flow? Yes. Sir. Okay, so gene. Okay, that also says yes. So just to just uh, to revise, gene flow is basically when the when, when there is a migration of a section of population, which I have shown here. Like let's say this is the green one is population A, and these dots are the individuals. When a section of the population moves to another region and uh, get mixed with another population, which here is shown by red. This is called uh, gene migration. And when gene migration happen multiple times, we call it a gene flow, correct? Now, as a result of, write down, as a result of gene migration or gene flow, as a result of gene migration and gene flow,
new genes or alleles new genes and alleles are added to the new population are added to the new population and are lost and are lost from the older one and are lost from the older population okay and if there is gene migration happening multiple times then it is called a gene flow which is the bulk flow of um, some alleles and genes from one population to another okay now the second factor that can affect hardy winberg equilibrium is called genetic drift so what now one was yes anna what was the first factor genetic flow or gene migration uh, uh, gene uh, flow uh, or gene migration thank you sir okay yeah and the second factor is genetic drift now one is flow and the other is drift what is a drift you must have heard this word drift it's a english word it's a common english word what do we mean by drift no one has heard of the word drift cars drift or drifting of cars it's a sudden change in the direction okay sudden change in direction or sudden flow from one to another so su sudden shift or sudden change in direction of any population is called genetic drift okay now in genetic drift what happens the same genetic flow which is happening over time so gene migration or genetic flow takes time to happen because one by one basically the um genes and alleles are moving from one population to another as the organisms are migrating correct but in genetic drift the factor the pressure for this change in direction or in change of genetic makeup of a population comes from outside now write down what happens in a genetic drift if the change in genes and allele frequency if the change in the gene or allele frequencies happen happen in a population in a population suddenly suddenly and by chance suddenly and by chance then that's called a genetic drift for example um let's say imagine a situation where let's say there were two species of beetle again let's take a green looking beetle and a red beetle okay and if there were genetic flow or genetic migration happening then one population will migrate to the other population slowly over time but let's say these populations are already living around in the same place so it's a mixed population living in the same place and now there is a stampede or any natural calamity that can kill beetles okay so let's say elephants just stampeded the region okay and these beetles uh let's say cannot just fly and escape so in a stampede almost 80% of total be beetles got crushed and died and by chance the 20% that survived 
So more than 99% of those 20% beetles that survived were just red beetles. Now here, this sudden shift or the sudden change in the allele frequency happened by chance, right? It could also have been just the green beetles. You understand? There's no mechanism here, but there's just a natural uh, pressure or something environmental change that just drove this genetic drift. Is it clear? So it's a change in allele frequency, which is different. And if it is so different, then it can cause speciation as well. But is this point clear that genetic, what is genetic drift? Yes, no. Yes. Yeah. Okay, now write down. Next, other factors, you already know about these. Other factors are mutation. So third factor is mutation and I don't have to explain mutation again. We have done it multiple times. So you know what is mutation, sudden random changes which are inheritable. That can also, you know, skew the Hardy-Winberg equilibrium or affect the Hardy-Winberg equilibrium. The fourth one is um, genetic recombination, okay? This we have studied in the sexual reproduction chapter where I have showed you with the help of chromosomes, how does recombination happens? Remember recombination? Two chromosomes yes. forming the chiasmata, right? So this can also affect Hardy-Winberg equilibrium because it makes new variations. And the fifth one is natural selection. Environment changes and due to a changing environment, the one which is best suited to survive in that environment, get selected by nature and the others. One example for natural selection we did was industrial melanization, right? Yes, sir. yes or no? Yeah. So in industrial melanization, you know that as the, um, as the pollution level uh, rose in the urban areas due to industries, the dark winged be the dark winged moths were selected naturally over the uh, white wing moths. So all these factors taken together, these five factors, gene flow or gene migration, genetic drift, mutation, genetic recombination, and natural selection, they can cause um, a change or a shift in Hardy-Winberg equilibrium. Now, basically all of them, these factors are changing allele fre frequencies, okay? Now write down the next point that allele frequencies sometimes, allele frequencies sometimes become so different. Allele frequencies sometimes becomes so different in the new population in the new population that they become that they become a different species makes sense right does it make sense to you in evolution? Yes. yes. Now this, when this happens, okay, then we are making new species, right? This process of becoming a different species is called speciation. When new species arise, write down. Speciation is when new species arise from the pre-existing ones. And what, are, what is the definition of species? You're from your junior classes.
definition of species people you are studying biology class 12 class 11th second chapter biological classification you must have defined species there but who remembers right what's gone is gone it was last year anyone has no clue what is a species now figure figure it out just right just now what is a species z um, yes anna is it like a group of same uh, animals from like they can interbreed with the same you know? yes you're right it's not just a group of same animals yes, it's same. a group of group of same animals that make a population and that population is capable of breeding among itself among themselves in under natural conditions that's the species definition okay and speciation happens due to change in the allele frequencies often okay when they become so different basically this is what is happening at the genetic level and in this case when the speciation is happening due to change in hardy winberg equilibrium or allele frequencies then the previous population became the founder population so they founded a new species right so the originally drifted population become founders so write down in this case the original drifted population in this case the above case that i have written here the original drifted population are known as the founders population it's called founders and this affect this whole effect of making new species is known as founder effect okay so you understand everyone what is founder effect yes okay so when you understand in the class and when you don't answer in the next class what should i infer from it either you are lying in the class you have not understood and you are saying that you understood or you are not going and consolidating in your memory right there can only be two possibilities so if you don't understand something you can ask me 10 20 30 times depending on when do you understand we'll move forward don't no issues but if you understand then you have to answer in the next class right that's the selection pressure okay everyone yes very good so founder effect now how do we know this that founder effect actually happens and speciation can also happen or natural selection is happening so you know uh, in microorganisms experiments have proven that some organisms which with pre existing mutations which are advantageous so mutations are mostly deleterious right mutations are not helpful mostly but sometimes mutations are helpful and advantageous and those advantageous mutations will be inherited by the next generations yes or no and over time yes. these small small changes will become significant and result in new phenotypes new abilities new structures produced by the organism and this will be known uh, over few generations this would result in speciation so write down as an example microbial 
or experiments in microorganisms write down experiments in microorganisms show that show that pre existing pre existing advantageous mutations pre existing advantageous mutations when selected and selected are passed on are passed on to the next generation to the next generation and result in and result in new phenotypes new phenotypes and these new phenotypes and these new phenotypes over a few generations over a few generations would lead to speciation is this clear is it clear everyone yeah someone should speak right because it becomes very boring teaching to a screen like just for the sake of my sanity i have given you an option to not let your videos on because of understandable reasons but you should either speak you should make the discussion interesting otherwise there are if you speak if you discuss there will be many interesting things that i can contribute to or teach you because that comes with the flow i cannot plan all of that some questions has to come from you for me to give you that information otherwise we'll just finish the syllabus right what's the fun in finishing the syllabus because since syllabus never finishes <laughs> okay now all of you have ncert with you right now yes yes yeah okay so please open your ncerts and also let me know the page in your ncerts there are figure there are two figures that talk about evolution of plants and animals through a diagrammatic representation it's towards the end of your chapter let me see if i can pull it out so the online source yes i got it did you figure it out it's a uh, page number i think 138 page number 138 and it's actually we are talking about summary or account of evolution in plants and i'm talking about
in this picture here. Can you all see this picture? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, a little big. Great. So we are going to do a in-class assignment now. This I do with all the batches. So what you have to do is, I'll give you some time. Like I'll give you, let's say, five minutes by clock in the class right here. And you have to read this graph. And I'll be giving you certain, so I'm making stars in front of some classes like monocots and dicots, both belong to angiosperms. To understand this and to do good in this, your class 11th, second chapter has to be a little strong. Then conifers, these are the cones producing. And then ferns, these are still ferns. And then bryophytes, these five, okay? So you have to, I'm also marking it here, bryophytes, ferns, conifers, dicots and monocots. You have to read this graph. Let me just tell you what's on the graph. On the y-axis, you see the evolutionary time period, right? And on the x-axis, it's the different types of plants which have evolved. Now you have to read this graph starting from chlorophyte ancestors, the earliest one. And you have to tell me about these five star marked categories that where, what ancestors did they evolve from? Okay, and which is the most, which has the most primitive functions and which has the most branching descent happening? So observations like this, you have to write two to three words about every category here. So which period, so evolutionary time period is written Paleozoic, Mesozoic, or and Cenozoic. Paleozoic is the most primitive, Meso is middle, and Cenozoic is the recent. And in that also there are divisions, Silurian, Devonian, Carboniferous, Permian, Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, ter Tertiary, and Quaternary. So Jurassic and Triassic, you know, these are famous for dinosaurs. So in plant animals also will do the same e exercise. So now I give you five minutes. Everyone understood? What do you have to do? For each category, you have to write their ancestors, their evolutionary uh, link, back in time, when did they diverge, um, and how old are their features by looking at the evolutionary time period, and which among the five star marked is the, uh, has the most primitive features and why, okay? Clear everyone? Yes. Aisha? You're not audible if you're speaking. Fatima, Rifa, Hanifa, Hiba. All of you have to do it right now. Okay? And your time starts now. I'll randomly ask someone for their inferences. Basically, this is an exercise for you to read evolutionary graph. Aisha, you're not audible. Yeah. Okay, so your time starts now for this assignment. I'm giving you five minutes exactly. Start. I'm just here. Ask me if you have any doubts.
couple of minutes more people. Okay, is it done everyone? People, is it done? Am I audible? Yes. Okay, so let's let's start with someone summarizing their notes. So who will begin? Uh, how about we start with Rifat. Rifat, are you there? Yes, Rifat, you have to speak. Can you, can you tell me what, what is your summary? If you are speaking, you are not audible, Rifat. Uh, Rifat, do you have any issues with the microphone? Are you speaking? Because you are mute if you are speaking. Uh, Heba, are you there? Heba, are you there? 
No one has a working microphone. Uh, so. Yes, Hannah. Yeah. Let's begin with you. Uh, so, chlorophyte ancestors uh, are the like source of all the plants. Yes. And so here in this graph, in this uh, graph, you're right. Correct. So these are the earliest plant ancestors. Okay. Chlorophyte means basically for all plants, they include they need chlorophyll, right? So some very simple organisms which were unicellular got this chlorophyll in them, basically like algae to begin with. Okay, unicellular algae. Yes, yeah, so they are the earliest plant ancestors. Yes, Anna, continue. Uh, and from there, uh, a division uh, came, which is the bryophytes. Exactly, right. So bryophytes are supposed to be evolved right after like this chlorophyte ancestors. So before they reached uh, tracheophyte ancestors, tracheophytes, one branch, you know, branching descent. So we are basically talking about that one branch went on to evolve and evolve and finally become a bryophyte. Yes. And, and uh, the tracheophyte ancestors. And after that, from tracheophytes, we have uh, three plants. One is uh, zo uh, Zozo, three. Uh, Zosterophyllum and uh, Zosterophyllum. Yeah. Zosterophyllum were the yes, they were, they were present in the Silurian era. Do you also see the era? Yeah. Here? And yeah. If, it, if it's like thin, that means it wasn't uh, very common at that time. And when it's like, you know, during the Jurassic era, the bryophytes and all were like so much uh, for. Uh, yes. So their, their thinness or thickness tells you their abundance in the nature. Correct. So till Carboniferous, but here bryophytes were not very, very abundant, right? Yeah. They were just there in pockets, some special conditions. But then after that, they uh, kind of started growing, but still their niches are limited. They cannot just grow everywhere around, right? So that's yeah. where you see the amount of like their abundance from the Permian till today is almost the same, right? Yeah, but their color gradients also tell you so. Like if the color gradients a little bit darker than it is there, it's um, more it was more in number before and it's going and the lighter shade tells that you it's turning extinct. Um you can't say that that's basically what it is conferring because for that matter, every one of it is getting lighter when they're coming on the top, right? Um, that does, that. That does not again? that does not means that all the plants are now getting extinct. We oh. we see so many plants around, but yes, the, the 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 size of the bin actually the width of the bin tells you about their abundance and abundance and also the variety, the different species that they have. Okay. Okay. Is it clear? Yes, continue, Hannah. And uh, after that, from the same tracheophyte ancestors comes the aborescent uh, lycopods. Yes. And at the same place called herbaceous lycopods. Herbaceous. Uh -huh. So, her yes, arborescent lycopods, you see that they terminate here, right? After yeah. the Permian, the, 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 you do not see any um, further. Yeah graph so they are extinct just like animals plants also go extinct right many plants have which were present in earlier uh, prehistoric earth are no longer present now they are going extinct so herbaceous lycopods though are still present you know and they also are more or less uh, their abundance is same and less because they only grow in certain regions they are found in certain regions yes continue uh, then uh, rhinia type plants, uh, they do not have any division or any evolution branches. Uh, then we move on to Pileophyton. Uh, they have many branches such as. Um, uh, it's Silophyton. 
okay so from chlorophyte ancestors uh, evolved the tracheophyte ancestors and then the rhenia type plants and xylophyton so this xylophyton is majorly from this point to today's angiosperms this whole spectrum has evolved from xylophyton ancestors right can you see this the red part of the graph this all have come from the xylophyton ancestors through branching various branchings but bryophytes which are present comes from chlorophyte ancestors right yes, yes continue um, then the uh, xylophyton are divided into like uh, eight, eight It's sorry, sorry, my bad. Uh, Ciliophytons are divided like are divided into six. Uh, what the main branch which holds the like? Um, See, there are many more branches that NCRT is not talking about. So don't don't worry about the numbers. Just worry about the star marks. Be the classes that have star marked. Okay. For example, ferns. Yes. Yes, divided into ferns and ginkgos and pinopids. Horses also conferas and then uh gentail and uh cyclas and first then seed for uh, first from uh polygenosperms seed ferns and from seed ferns we have cycad and dicotyledons and monocotyledons and yes so in monocots and dicots you see the dicots came first then came, came the monocots right and ferns and conifers came before even before the angiosperms and so, pro gymnosperms are before so you must have studied in class 11 gymnosperms and angiosperms Gymno gymnosperms are the plant that produce naked seeds without a fruit covering on it right and angiosperms are the plants that produce flowers and then flowers go on to because flowers are reproductive organs so flowers go on to reproduce sexually and then give rise to seed and fruit. Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me, Hannah. You had a, you were asking a question, I think. Yeah. Um. This uh gentails. Can you see that? It's ne It's not gentails. It's netails. Okay. G is silent. Okay, sir. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, uh, do you know that? Is it like a direct descendant from chlorophyte ancestor? No, they are also xylophyte on. They are not direct from chlorophyte because chlorophyte, uh, one branch diverged to become bryophytes and the other became tracheophyte ancestors, which kept on evolving. Oh. So I, I remember I told you that one question was that which of the following star marked categories do you think have the most uh, ancient features in the plant kingdom? Yeah, bryophytes. Yes. Can you now um, figure out why it has to be bryophytes? Yeah, after the chlorophyte, immediately from there, it's like uh, diverged. Yes, the branching descent is happening very, very early. It's diverging very early during plant evolution, correct? Yeah. For that reason. Yeah, very well. Okay. So...
Hello, am I audible, everyone? Yes. Yeah, sorry, I just logged off. I lost internet for some time. Okay, let me share the screen again. Is my voice clear to you? Yes. Just a moment. Okay. If it lags, please let me know, which it might. But let me know if it does. Can you all see the screen that I'm sharing? Is the yes. screen visible? Okay. Yes, Hannah, are you there? Yes, sir. Yes, please finish with your observations. Okay. Then after that, uh, like only the stars ones, right? Yeah. So so you finished basically, right? So you touched all the points that yeah. uh, uh, in angiosperms, monocots, dicots, how they evolved in what pe what pe period, the earliest uh, in the given in this given sure. chart is bryophytes. Yes, Anna. Uh, I still have a doubt though. Yeah. Is there a difference between ferns and seed ferns? Yes. So ferns, like if you see it here, and if you know, seed ferns are those which produce seeds, but they are naked seeds because they are arising from pro-gymnosperms. Gymnosperms, like cycads, they later on are called gymnosperms and angiosperms. So this branch will go on to form gymnosperms, this branch. Can you see this branch here? Yes, sir. This is the gymnosperm branch. And then this one is angiosperm. And you can see that angiosperm branch is the widest, right? So they were almost not there. Flowering plants were almost not there till the Jurassic, right? So till the Jurassic period, you, you see very less abundance of gymnosperms. They're almost not there, but then they just bloom like blast kind of. And now today, you see that angiosperms are the biggest uh, category of plants around us because almost every plant around us make produces flowers and seeds and fruits, yes or no? Yes, yes. Of some or the other kind, yeah. So it also explains you that though certain groups like these horse tails, let's say horse tails or even conifers, they were wide, they were more abundant at one point of time and then they Currently, they are not that abundant. Here also, you will see that the abundance was more, but currently they are not that abundant. In case of seed ferns and pro gymnosperms also they were abundant. And then two things diverged. One became in angiosperms and the other went towards the gymnosperm branch through cycads, right? Okay. Yeah. So does this make sense to all of you? Okay, let me dictate certain points, write down certain things before um, about the brief account of evolution of plants. Uh, <clears throat> so this one will not change. Sorry? Yes, Hannah, tell me. Uh, just one minute, sir. Okay, I'm dictating, okay? Yeah. Shall I dictate? Write down the first, the first form of life appeared. The first form of life. Now the first form of life that appeared was not cellular, okay? It did not have all the cellular components to be called so that we could call it a proper cell. So the first form of life appeared around 3.2 billion years ago. The first form of life appeared around 3.2 billion years ago. And if you have to choose among plants and animals, who do you think evolved first? Plants or animals? Plants. Yes. Why? Because they could photosynthesize. They could directly harvest sun's energy to produce their own food, right? They are the primary producers. So the first form of life evolved around 3.2 billion years ago, BYA. 
and the first form of cellular life by cellular life i mean the kind of life unicellular life that we see today bacteria the first form of cellular life evolved around 2 billion years ago okay next point some of some of the primitive cells some of the primitive cells or the earliest cells developed the ability developed the ability to release oxygen or to produce oxygen you know that's where photosynthesis or processes which are like photosynthesis began so could you repeat that one uh okay um some of the primitive or earliest cells yes some of the primitive and earliest or earliest cells developed the ability developed the ability to release oxygen to release oxygen and we know when is oxygen released right when is it released um like in the carbon dioxide no in the process of photosynthesis plants release oxygen yeah yeah so which means these primitive cells for the first time started some processes which were equivalent or which were like photosynthesis now we are not we cannot say with surety it was exactly the photosynthetic process but it to release oxygen it must be doing something which was happening in photo, which which happens during photosynthesis so write down this reaction this reaction could have been similar to photosynthesis this reaction could have been similar to photosynthesis and what is required in photosynthesis they are the chlorophyte ancestors basically about whom we are talking right now mm -hmm. so what is required for photosynthesis what are, what are the three things which are most important to do photosynthesis nitrogen sun and carbon dioxide nitrogen yeah so from the roots why do we need nitrogen for photosynthesis from the roots it takes nitrogen so but where is nitrogen used in photosynthesis it's like used in a minimal amount sir where like um that's what i thought. to do what what is photosynthesis what are they synthesizing what are plants synthesizing a uh, raw material like yes what is that raw material sunlight biscuits chocolates no sir cookies carbon dioxide they are producing carbon dioxide no they take uh, sunlight and carbon dioxide and produce it into oxygen but they release oxygen that is what they are so what are they synthesizing what is photosynthesis what is what is a plant synthesizing in photosynthesis its food plant is preparing its own food and what is food carbohydrates starch or glucose glucose is c6h12o6 is there any nitrogen in glucose no carbon hydrogen and oxygen so basically they are taking co2 and oxidizing it sorry uh, they are taking co2 and they are reducing it so basically they need hydrogen to reduce co2 and that they get from water so three things which are most important is sunlight to harvest the energy to split water the second thing they need water which is split into hydrogen and oxygen the third thing they need co2 where they put hydrogen and reduce it so from co2 co2 has carbon and oxygen all it requires is hydrogen to become glucose so in this reaction hydrogen is missing so they bring hydrogen from water and when they split water oxygen is left which is not required so that oxygen is removed that's how oxygen is removed during photosynthesis right no role of nitrogen is here 
like not directly in the process. Nitrogen is required for whole new different thing to make uh, nitrogenous substances, amino acids, or to uh, make enzymes inside the cell which contains nitrogen, right? But we do not consider it for the process of photosynthesis. Is it clear? You know? Are you there? You know? Am I audible, people? Yes. Okay. So I think Hannah is not able to hear me. Okay. So anyway, so photosynthesis began, and these are like so. You need uh, you basically need three things: water, sunlight, and CO two, and you also need pigments. The pigments which can help in photosynthesis, which happen to be chlorophyll in plant system. So these chlorophyte ancestors had chlorophyll, so they could release oxygen in the atmosphere. Okay, so we'll, we'll stop here and we'll continue from this point onwards in the next class. Okay, everyone? Yes, sir. Okay, so I'll see you in the next class. Take care.